Wesley United Methodist Church. We're so thankful that you're here worshiping with us today. And if you are new here, we warmly welcome you. Between services, we have a fellowship time down the hall here, and you are invited. You're all invited to that. You also have a Making Connections card in your bulletin, and please fill that out, and you can place it in the offering plate. That allows us to know that you are here, and if you have any ways that you want to communicate with us, that's a wonderful way to do that and let us know anything or any needs that you have. Well, the Christmas season is here already. We just blinked and it was uh, summer, I don't know. And we want to remember those people of our church family who are homebound or grieving or recovering from illness or surgery. There will be Christmas cards in the fellowship time on the tables. And if you would fill, sign those and, and write a little note on those, there's all different Christmas cards for homebound on different tables. So get around to the different tables. It'll be a great way for you to get to know other people at different tables and sign those for us. And then we're, we want you to leave them there at the end because Pastor Janice will pick them up for mailing. That'll be both this Sunday and next Sunday. Well, this coming Saturday night on December 9th at 5.30, we have our kids' musical, The Night Shift Before Christmas. And the kids have been working all uh, semester on that. And at 5.30, there'll be appetizers and dessert down in the fellowship hall. And then at 6.30 in here is the show. If you are able to attend, there will be tickets that you can purchase for donation or just have if you don't have any money on you. Um, but there'll be tickets to let us know how many people will be going. And those will be out here in the front between services today. So if you're interested, make sure you pick one of those up. Well, also, we have our children's ministry team, our vision team, has um, decided to do a big Pizza Palooza informational to let everybody know what's happening in children's ministry and where we're going with that. And if you are interested, this is a great on-ramp time. If you've never been a part of children's ministry, and that just sounds like something fun you want to be a part of, and um, there's so many different ways to plug in, just write on your connection card, children's ministry, and then I will um, reach out to you you and you can come to the pizza informational next Sunday after church and, and learn more about what we're doing and the direction that things are going and stuff. So the sign-ups out at the information desk are the new members class on December 10th. Please go ahead and sign up for that if you're interested in becoming a member or wanting to know more about that. And then there's also a lighting of the Advent wreath sign-up uh, during this Advent season. We have people that read scripture and light the wreath and light the candles. Uh, and also is Brock, yes, Brock is here, and Brock has an announcement about ASP. Good morning, church. Um, once again, we will be in ministry with Appalachia Service Project from June 10th through the 16th of 2018, because we get to worry about next year already. Um, so if that is something that you have always done and you know you're excited to go again, there's a sign-up sheet out at the information desk that you can sign up and, so that you can make sure and stay current on all the information for this year. If that is something new to you, if you are uh, age 14 and have completed your freshman year of high school, you're welcome to join us. And if that's something you're looking forward to, um, you should be receiving something in the mail this week. And we will be having an informational meeting this coming Wednesday from 6 to 7 in the parlor. So if you'd like more information about what that trip is all about, uh, please join us on Wednesday from 6 to 7. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you can start inviting your friends to the upcoming worship services on December 17th. I can't wait. Our choir has got their cantata, which will be wonderful, both services. And so invite your friends. There'll be a, an amazing day of music that you won't want to miss. And then uh, on Christmas Eve morning will be the fourth in our series of our Advent services. That service will take place at 10 
10 o'clock. That's a difference in time, so make note of that. It's Christmas Eve morning, December 25th, is a Sunday. So we'll have normal worship, just one normal worship service at 10 o'clock. I don't know why I said normal. What does that mean? Um, and, and we'll have that at 10 o'clock, and it'll be the fourth in our Joseph series during the Advent season. And then, please come back in the evening for one of our two worship services for Christmas Eve, and we'll have a 7 o'clock family-friendly service that the kids will sing at, and the chancel choir will sing, and then we'll be able to um, have the kids go to a birthday party for Jesus that's going to be lots of fun. It'll be a fabulous service. And then at 11 o'clock, if you like that nighttime feel of driving home at midnight on Christmas Eve, there's the 11 o'clock service that'll be a really neat uh, service as well. Both services will end with candlelight and singing Silent Night. So if you uh, need any other information about things going on in the church, please make sure your email is up to date on the connection card so that you're getting emails about this. There's always a hard copy of announcements at the Information Center. And Bob has uh, some information about our global migration. No, he doesn't. Not yet. Not yet. We're going to keep him in suspense. Uh, but good morning. Uh, I'm Bob Swickard. I'm the pastor here. And uh, which means that I get to lead the normal services and the abnormal services that we hold here in the church. And uh, as a pastor, I want to invite the Baker family to come up this morning uh, because, um, you know, December has kind of slipped in amongst us this week. And, um, you know, it's amazing how fast December rolls around every year. And uh, the Baker family is going to be leading us in the lighting of the Advent wreath. And, um, you know, that's what we do through the course of Advent. Advent are those Sundays that lead up to Christmas. And um, each week we light an additional candle. And we realize visually that we're getting closer to the day um, for the promised coming of Jesus. And so we're going to be celebrating that in a minute too. But as I was thinking this morning about, you know, some of the Psalms, how they were used in worship. One of the Psalms that came to my mind was, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. I hope that you're glad you came to church today. Because you're here on a great Sunday. Every Sunday is a great Sunday to be here. And this is no different. So Lord, inhabit the praises of your people here today. Move amongst us as we worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen to the promise of scripture from Matthew 12 as Jesus quotes the prophet Isaiah. Look at my servant whom I've chosen. He is my beloved who pleases me. I will put my spirit upon him and he will proclaim justice to the nations. He will not fight or shout or raise his voice in public. He will not crush the weakest reed or put out a flickering candle. Finally, he will cause justice to be victorious and his name will be the hope of all the world. Today, we light this candle as a symbol of Christ, who is our hope. There. Let us pray. Faithful God, out of darkness you bring light, out of sorrow you bring joy, out of despair you bring hope. Renew our hope today that we may work toward Christ's advent of peace among all nations. In the strong name of our risen Savior Jesus, amen. Do you stand let's worship the Lord this morning.
Please remain standing and join me in the unison congregational prayer. Gracious and loving God, on this first day, we are reminded that we are entering into a time of waiting for the arrival of Christmas. For many of us, this time of waiting is all too common. People are waiting for help to come to their broken situation. Refugees are waiting to find a welcoming place to call home. Families wait to see if there will be enough money for food or Christmas. Friends wait for the other to take the first step of reconciliation. We all wait for the redemption of this broken world. Come, Lord Jesus. Thank you for the message of Christmas. Thank you for hope fulfilled. Thank you for your grace that enables us to wait. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. reading today is from the gospel according to John. It's chapter 14 verses 6 through 14. And right before this the disciples are all gathered together and Jesus is telling them that he's getting ready to go to another place but there is room for all of them and they know the way to get there. But Thomas being Thomas says we don't know where you're going. How can how do we know the way? So Jesus says I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know him and you have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and we'll be satisfied. And Jesus said to him, Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? 
the words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own. But the Father who dwells in me does this work. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. But if you do not, then believe me because of the works themselves. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and in fact, do greater works than these, because I am going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If, if in my name you ask me for anything, I will do it. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Mike. I want to invite you, if you would join with me as we sing hymn number 220. And as we sing, we want to invite our young friends today to go off to Children's Church with Gina. said. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Let's come before the Lord again in prayer. Gracious and loving God, we're thankful for the day that you've given us, and we thank you for the privilege that we have to be able to pray. When we consider what is available to us, it goes far deeper than simple words that we put in a string and repeat on occasion. Rather, our prayer, this gift of prayer, is the way that we foster our relationship with you. That we can talk with you. Tell you what we're feeling. Invite you to speak to us and to the situations in our lives. And God, we do that now. Lord, I pray for those that are here today that are in need of your intervention in their lives. For healing, for restoration of broken relationships, for guidance, for a peace that passes all understanding in the midst of tumultuous times. God, you've invited us to cast all of our cares on you because you care so deeply for us. 
And many times, God, we take that for granted. Lord, would you pour out your spirit upon us here today? Draw us close to yourself. Help us to give all of our lives to you. To not just look at this thing we called faith as something ancillary to life, but as life itself. God, we praise you and we thank you. We love you. We adore you. And we pray that you would continue to draw us close to yourself, even as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For a mission moment today, we have a couple of opportunities that I want you to be aware of. Um, last week, I gave you the heads up of that this is Global Migration Sunday, but um, there's another thing that's come to the fore, and uh, um, actually a couple of the things. One is, you may have noticed a little table full of blankets and toilet paper if you came in the west entrance. Um, or Are they still there? I didn't come in the west entrance. Are they there? Okay, they're good. We, we had collected over 150 blankets for EIU's blanket drive and there's loads of uh, toilet paper to give uh, to one stop uh, community so um, thank you for your generosity for bringing in those blankets for bringing in the toilet paper that will be a blessing uh, to the people that receive it also on Thursday morning we have a men's group and we get together for Bible study and we just work our way through a book of the Bible every Thursday morning at 7 and, um, and so uh, one of the gentlemen Don brought a uh, coffee tin one day and said, you know, maybe we could just take a little offering and we'll see what happens. Well, um, some time after that started, we recently counted and there were $405 in the offering taken up, 410, excuse me, on, that, was, that was collected on Thursday morning. And so on Thursday morning, we, we started to ask and Don, after hearing a sermon a couple of weeks ago, thought it would be fun to empower you to be a blessing to someone. Someone. And so as we considered what to do with the $405, we thought, let's give it away for the purpose of giving it away. So after the service, we have about 81, 82 um, rolls of $5 bills. There's five singles in a row. And so on your way out of church today, if you want, if you want to take us up on this, uh, take the $5 and give it away. Pray, ask God to lead you where God would have you to put that. Whether it's in a bucket, a Salvation Army bucket, or to go down to a food pantry, or if it's someone on the street. Wherever God leads you, uh, if you're willing to do this, they'll be available. And Mike Stanfield will be over on by this door uh, with the coffee tin and some rolls of five. So if you want to be a blessing to someone, we want to empower you to do that. Lastly, uh, again, um, last week I gave you the heads up that today is what the United Methodist Church is calling Global Migration Sunday. And this one day we are focusing on one of the greatest needs the world has ever seen. And so I want you to invite you to take a look at this video.
I don't know if that number stuns you. 65 million people are displaced today. And uh, Mary and Joseph, um, mother and father of Jesus, you know, Joseph adopted father, we'll talk about that a little bit later. But Mary and Joseph knew a little something about being refugees. So, this is a big need. And the United Methodist Church wanted to be able to respond in some way. So if you feel God leading you to respond in some way, we've got some uh, envelopes in the pew backs, uh, and you can put your special offering in that envelope. Uh, if you write a check uh, to this church, just put refugees in the memo line, and that will help us know uh, to, to put that toward Global Migration Sunday. Uh, but we want to invite you to be a part of that if God is leading you to do it. The need need is certainly great. So with that, I want to invite our ushers, if they would prepare to receive the morning offering. You know, every week we have an opportunity to worship God as we bring these tithes and gifts and offerings, recognizing that all we have is a gift. God's entrusted it to us. And so um, we bring these gifts to worship and to honor the Lord. May God bless you.
gracious God, as we turn to your word this morning, we pray that once more you would write your word upon our hearts and weave your word into the fabric of our souls as we seek to become more like Christ. God, we invite your Holy Spirit to move among us in such a way that you convict our hearts and convince us, move us, teach us, direct us, guide us, change us from the inside out. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. How many of you would say you look like your dad? How many say you look like your mom? How many are glad you don't look like either of your parents? No, I'm kidding. Don't answer that question. It's interesting to me, the older we get, you know, it's at least my own experience. The older I get, the more I realize I look like my dad. Every time I look in the mirror, I think, oh my gosh, it's my dad looking back at me, you know. And you can see a picture. This picture um, is actually a video that Gina took. Um, one day, Josh was back visiting, and we were in Springfield, and, and uh, we didn't realize that we both kind of put the same clothes on, <laughs> blue shirts, khaki shorts, and uh, if, if this could work, um, but it's not reading the, um, uh, the Apple version on our computer, but if you could see this in motion, we are actually walking in step, and if you look at our shoulders, our shoulders are moving identically the same, and Gina was just like, and the girls were behind us, obviously, and they, and they took that, that video of it, and we just laughed because of the similarities of father and son. And whether it's a father, son, mother, daughter, it's not uncommon to see those common traits, right? People who gave us birth, or even people who nurtured us. You know, adoptive parents also have influence on our lives. It's the whole nature-nurture thing. Uh, our nature is the DNA pool, perhaps. The nurture is the way that we've been raised. And this is probably true of Jesus, too, right? And Joseph. G Joseph and Jesus don't share the same DNA. Joseph is more the adoptive father of Jesus, not the biological father. But even so, Joseph had a great deal of influence over Jesus, right? Our dad's impact on us is great. I mean, think about all the ways that you've been impacted by your father. A friend of mine uh, asked uh, some uh, people in his church to, to post how they had been affected by their father. And their responses were remarkably the same. They all seemed to boil down to a teaching, an example, or an inspiration. And maybe you can identify with that. When you think about how your dad has impacted you, maybe it was something that he taught you. Maybe it was something that he modeled for you. Or maybe it was some way that your life was inspired by how your dad lived his. I would think there'd be many things the same with Joseph and Jesus. Now, in Jesus' day... Dads had some responsibilities. In fact, there were four of the prime directive of any father. There were four things that a good father would do when raising um, his children. The dad must teach, especially the son in Jesus' day, must teach the son how to read the Torah, the law, the first five books of the Bible. Every good Jewish father would have taught his son how to read Torah. The second thing that the dad would do is, is to um, basically tell his son how to get married. And this was back in the day when if you can't find a wife, one will be appointed for you. Right? Arranged marriage. Matchmaker, matchmaker, make me... Okay. How to read the Torah, how to get married. The father would teach the son a trade. It was important for the father to teach the son how to earn a living. In fact, one rabbi said that a father who does not teach his son a trade is as responsible as if he taught his son to steal. 
That's how important it was for a dad to teach his son a trade. Because they understood that they would be, the son would grow up and be married and take a wife, have a family, and that son would be responsible for providing. So he had to know a trade. The last thing has been a little bit in debate among Jewish scholars, but the fourth thing that a good Jewish dad would teach his son is how to swim. <laughs> Don't ask. I have no idea. I, I'm guessing because uh, if you lived around the Sea of Galilee, uh, the Dead Sea, uh, and you were out in the water, I mean, clearly, uh, it was one way, you know, uh, that you, you could survive if you knew how to swim. You see, we're starting a new series this, for this month. We're looking at Joseph, the father of Jesus. And it's a little tough because there are only like 16 scriptures, 16 passages in scripture that refer to Joseph, father of Jesus, by name. So we have very little to go on. But there are some things that we can learn as we look at the life of Joseph. And so that's what we're going to be doing for the next few weeks. He was a carpenter, wasn't he? Joseph, he was a carpenter. Uh, that word in Greek is tekton. And a tekton was someone who worked primarily with wood, but they also worked with stone. Uh, there's a lot of stone working to be done in the Holy Land. Uh, if, if any of you have ever been there, one of the jokes that our guide gave us was, you know, um, there were two, God gave charge of two angels to distribute all the rocks on the, on the earth. And when one of the angels got over the Holy Land, his bag broke, you know, and that's how they explain, you know, all the rocks that are in the Holy Land. There's plenty of rocks to work with. Um, a, a carpenter, a tecton was such, and then there was another um, a more master craftsman who was an architecton which is the word from which we get architect uh, someone who worked masterfully with wood and with stone but it's fun as I've been looking at Joseph and trying to to, to see what Joseph's going to teach us you know one of the one of the questions is well what are the traits that a carpenter has to have I mean if Jesus is growing up in a carpenter's shop around Joseph the carpenter and if Jesus is observing everything that his dad does what are some of the traits that a carpenter would have to have well the first thing is patience and some of you who have ever tried to put together um, you know those build your own shelf units that yeah I'm not really good with those the patience on that one you'd have to have strength you know, probably a strong man. You have to have a, a, an element of vision with what you're going to build, right? My guess is, as Jesus is growing up in his dad's shop, that he watched his dad build a yoke for a yoke of, uh, for oxen. He probably saw his dad build a, a manger, you know, for a feeding trough, although there were stone feeding troughs as well. But he had to have vision. What is it you're going to create? Craftsman. You first begin with an idea in your mind and then you see it to reality. You also have to have the ability to hit your thumb with a hammer and not embarrass the family in front of a pastor. I just threw that in for fun. Um, so, so what does a carpenter do? And it's when we start drilling down in what a carpenter does that we start to get even more um, of a picture of Joseph and Jesus' relationship. A carpenter will, will make something out of the pieces present. A, a carpenter will take these, these pieces that are on the floor and put them together to be something more than they are by themselves. A carpenter will, will make rough places smooth. If you've ever had a sticky door, you take the door off the hinges and you take a planer to the top of the door and you plane it down, right? And you smooth it out so that it closes more easily. They make strong, they make steady, they make dependable. 
What would they work with in wood? Well, um, there's a place called Sepphoris, which was about four miles from Nazareth. And Sepphoris was overthrown by the Roman uh, government and was destroyed. And so in Jesus' day, many carpenters would have made their way to Nazareth so that they could have a job in Sepphoris as it was being rebuilt. So any of the roofing structures, the beams for the roofs, uh, the doors to the house made out of wood, uh, tables uh, at which they would sit on the floor, those would have been made by carpenters as well. And Joseph would have taught the tools of the trade, tips of the trade, techniques of the trade. But if you drill down even farther, you discover that a carpenter has a purpose. And what you find is that the purpose is twofold of a carpenter. The purpose of a carpenter is to build and repair. Right? To create something or to repair something that's broken. The carpenter builds and repairs. And I wonder if we don't discover a little bit of our own purpose if we look at this carefully. Because Jesus was kind of like his dad. His adoptive dad. Wow. His adoptive dad, in that his dad was a carpenter. And Jesus came to this earth to build and to repair. But Jesus was much more so like his heavenly father. As you heard in John 14, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And if you really knew me, you'll know my Father as well. And from now on, you know him because you've seen him. And Philip said, Lord, just show us your dad. Show us your father, Jesus, Philip said. And Jesus goes, Philip, don't you know me by now? H have I been with you for this long and you still don't know me? Because anyone who's seen me, Philip, has seen my dad. Anyone who's seen me has seen my father in heaven is what Jesus wants Philip to hear and what he wants us to hear. The God of the universe, the God who created this whole world and everything in it is invisible, completely other, behind a veil. We cannot see God. Only Moses saw the glory of God but did not see God himself. And so God sent Jesus to be the visual. And Jesus says... Whoever's seen me has seen my Father. And Jesus goes on to say, The words I say, I don't speak on my own authority. I'm not even speaking on my own behalf. I'm speaking on behalf of my Father. It's the Father who lives in me. And it's the Father who's doing His work through me. Believe me when I tell you, when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or at least believe the evidence you see in the works that I do. And then Jesus says, Very truly I tell you, Whoever believes in me will do what I have been doing. You want to see the Father? Look at Jesus. Look at how, how does the, what would the Father do if the Father were here? Look at Jesus because he reveals it. Jesus tells us that we know what he looks like, the Father, by the things that Jesus does. You want to know what compassion looks like? Look at Jesus. Watch Jesus in Scripture embracing a leper. Or talking to someone who no one else would talk to. Watch Jesus heal someone that no one else would heal. This is God's DNA that we see in Christ. The DNA of the Father is to build and to repair, to heal and restore, to love the unlovable, to embrace the unembraceable. 
That's the DNA of the Father. And we saw it in Jesus. We see it in Scripture. So the question today is, do you look like your dad? Not your earthly father, but your heavenly father. You see, God calls you to a life of a carpenter that has a purpose. To know your heavenly dad and be engaged in the family business to build and to repair. Ephesians 5, chapter, chapter 5, verse 1 says, Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children. Imitate your heavenly Father. Imitate the grace. Imitate the compassion. Imitate the mercy. Imitate the embracing of the unlovable. Imitate sacrificial love. As children of God. Do you look like your heavenly dad? Do you look like Jesus? You see, you'll, le you'll learn what God the Father looks like when you see what Christ does. So my question for you today is this. Are there relationships in your life that you need to attend to? Are there areas in your life where you find brokenness? Are, are there bridges that you need to build with other people? People that you don't understand. People that don't think like you. People that don't look like you. Are there bridges that you need to build? Are there relationships that need repairing? You know, I mentioned that a friend of mine had put on Facebook, you know, tell me what you received from your father, the influence. And this one woman wrote, um, I'm not going to sugarcoat this, but I got alcoholism from my dad. And PTSD, because he never learned how to deal with life. And then she went on to say the thing that she got from her grandfather was how to live like Christ. You know, the things that we get from our parents can be for good or for ill. But here we are in December. And maybe, the, maybe you've been holding back on building bridges or repairing relationships, seeking forgiveness or in embracing forgiveness and extending that to someone in your family. But maybe now's a good time as any to take our lead from Joseph who builds and repairs, to look to Jesus who came to this earth to build and to repair. So maybe is there a relationship for you that as far as it depends on you, you could seek to build and repair? Or maybe you find yourself today and you've never started the most important relationship in your life, which is your relationship with God the Father, who loves you, who cares about you, who cares what happens to you, who wants to be in a relationship with you, who wants to do life with you, who wants to be at the center of your being, who wants to teach you like a father teaches a child how to build and how to repair and how to live for him and bring glory to him in this life. If you've never invited Christ to be the leader of your life, if you've never said to God, I want you to be my God, I want you to come into my life, you could do that today. And God begins to teach you the tips and the uh, tips of the trade, the techniques of the trade that we see in Christ. 1 Corinthians 3.18 says, And we who with unveiled faces reflect the glory of the Lord are being transformed into His image with intensifying glory which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Do you know that today God is in the work of transforming you into the likeness of His Son, Jesus? So that you can look more and more like your Heavenly Father. You know, the way Jesus grew in carpentry was from spending all the time that He did in the workshop watching, learning, growing. God wants to teach us the important things of life. And the lessons go far beyond studying and getting married and learning a trade and swimming. God wants to teach us how to build and
and how to repair with our spouses our friends our co-workers our neighbors with himself let's pray gracious God there may be people in our lives uh, with whom we need to exhibit patience the only way we can do that is with the presence of your spirit living within us because we can't do it on our own so would you pour out your spirit on us Lord, some of us need to ask you for the vision that you have for us. Help us to see our lives in a different way. Help us to see our lives with a different ending. Help us to see our lives with what it looks like when you're in the center of our life. God, give us a vision for what you are currently doing in our hearts and in our lives. Make something out of the pieces present in our lives today. Make the rough places smooth, Lord. And make our relationship with you strong and steady and dependable. We ask it all in Christ's name. Amen. You know, it's fitting that we would come to this table of grace today as this table of grace reminds us the extent to which Jesus loved us. And we remember that it was on the night that Jesus was betrayed when he invited his close friends to an upper room and he said, I have longed to share this meal with you. And so Jesus, when the disciples were present, he took the bread and he had given thanks over the bread countless times with the disciples. But this time, when Jesus, after he had given thanks, he broke the bread and he said, this is my body which is broken for you. So take and eat, all of you, and as often as you eat the bread, remember me. And when the supper was over, we remember how he took the cup and he said, This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. So take and drink, all of you, and as often as you do, remember me. The Apostle Paul reminds us that as often as we eat of the bread and drink of the cup, what we're doing is we're participating in the life and the ministry, the death and the resurrection of Jesus. They understood the body to represent everything that Jesus did in the flesh. And they understood the cup to represent the spirit that animated Jesus' life. So when we participate in these elements, we're inviting the acts of Christ, the, the actions of Christ, and the spirit of Christ inside of us. That we may cooperate with what God is doing in and through us. So Lord, would you pour out your spirit on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us, the body and blood of Christ, so that we can be for the world, the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until that great and glorious day, God, when we're feasting at your heavenly banquet. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. I want to invite those that are going to help serve to come forward and um, receive the elements from Gina and uh, prepare with that. And as they're doing that, let me just give a, a few words about how we celebrate communion uh, here at Wesley. First of all, um, we understand this to be uh, not a United Methodist table, but we understand it to be the Lord's table, uh, which means that all are welcome at the Lord's table here. Uh, if you are at a point where you would like to grow in your relationship, you may not even know what that next step is, but you're willing to take a step toward Christ, please know that you're welcome to receive these elements here today. We'll take by intention, uh, which means when you come down, you'll get a piece of the bread, uh, dip a little piece of the corner of the bread in the cup and in essence receiving both elements at the same time. And then after you've received, uh, you're welcome to go to spend some time at the altar rail um, in prayer or you can go back to your church or <laughs> back to your church uh, or even your seat, uh, your pew. Um, but um, also, if for any reasons, uh, physical limitations, you can't come forward. If you would let one of the ushers know, wave your hand toward the end um, we'll be happy to bring those elements to you. Uh, but this is God's gift offered to you. It came at a great price. But it's yours 
for the receiving. So come as you are led to receive this great gift from God.
loving God, thank you for this holy mystery in which you reveal yourself to us. Thank you for the many ways that you're at work in our lives, building, repairing, restoring, and renewing. Lord, we pray that even as these elements become part of our physical bodies, that your spirit would nourish our souls to the extent that we grow more like our Savior Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Would you stand and let's sing together, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. miss all the Christmas hymns, carols, I know. So, you know, I know some of you may be purists and you like doing Advent hymns during Advent and only Christmas hymns at Christmas. For those of you that are that way, you're only a little over 2,000 years late. Uh, so we're just going to sing the songs of Christmas this Advent. It's just, that's what we're going to do this year because they're so deep and so rich. And so I hope you'll join us throughout this month. There's so many things that are going on for this Friday. Lessons and carols that EIU puts on. Is that this Friday? Yeah, this coming Friday in this room. Uh, is, and so that's, gonna, that's coming up. And um, Betsy Warren, El El Elifritz Warren, is going to be speaking on the 17th. We have the cantata coming up on the 17th. Uh, there are just some great things coming up. So we hope that you'll join us. But as you go from this place today, you're not going alone. God's going with you.
He's going ahead of you to lead you on your way. He's going behind you to encourage you on your way. He's going underneath of you to support you on your way. He's going beside you to be your friend along that way. And he'll go inside of you if you'll let him to be your light along the way. Amen. Have a great week. Thank you.